to Olympus, land of the gods. Uh, my name is Anita Payne and um, I am wife, muse and other things, framer, etc. etc. to the famous artist Richard Payne. Um, uh, we'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming to the Common Gallery today. It's just been a, a delight for us to be exhibiting, or for Richard to be exhibiting in such a fantastic space. Um, I'd like to introduce Greg Mellion. Um, who is also a fellow artist, a brother of the brush, uh, along with uh, Jeff Macon, um, who all understand and appreciate how important it is not only to let your work be seen by the world, but also to, for the work to be seen in such a fantastic environment. So let me hand over to you. Thanks, Anita. Uh, hello, everybody. My name's Greg Bowden, and uh, it's my pleasant uh, duty to introduce Jeff Macon, who is opening Richard's uh, exhibition today. Um, Jeff and I go back many years. Um, for those of you who don't know much about the art world, uh, Jeff is probably one of Australia's most distinguished landscape artists. Uh, he's also an art critic and director of Port Jackson Press Australia, which I think is coming up to its 40th anniversary this year and uh, is one of Australia's leading uh, printmaking houses. Um, Jeff himself has had 60 solo exhibitions and is represented in galleries like the National Gallery of Australia. He's also one of the few artists who actually have a hotel named after him, uh, which was a boutique hotel in Melbourne, opened in 2007. So Richard, you and I have got a bit of a way to go. <laughs> So, uh, uh, welcome to Jeff Macon, who's going to say a few words to open Rich Six. We should thank you. Thank you, Greg. It doesn't really get much better than uh, this to be invited by a fellow artist to say a few words and to open uh, his exhibition. But there are some things happening here today which I've really got to comment upon first, first off. I, I think you can safely say that, amongst many other things, Richard is going to be um, remembered as the man who, who really brought the pagans into this old house of God. <laughs> <laughs> the pagans are back, their depictions are on the wall, a much older um, group of gods than, uh, than the Christians one, ones which are in fact in the chapel next door. The stages of the cross are there in bar relief. And these, I have to say, are happier. When you look at the, the, um, you know, the actual pagan gods, they look as if they're enjoying life. They come down from uh, uh, Mount Olympus, they mix it with the locals, and, um, and there's, no, um, there's no sort of aloofness, there's sort of a humanity to it that I find sometimes missing um, in uh, the various Christian religions. So, as it's Sunday, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's sort of uh, quite apt that you've opened it on Sunday. I don't know whether it's your intention to, uh, to re reintroduce paganism, but um, certainly uh, the, the local uh, uh, cardinal will certainly hear about this. You know, well, don't place to start. So, that's the first observation. The next thing is this charming space. I think the space is just uh, just right for this sort of exhibition. I wasn't aware, I haven't really been here before. So please forgive me, although I just live over the, over the hill at Chewton. The space is just great for this sort of exhibition. The other thing that is remarkable is that these works, some, I think, almost 50 works, seem to span, with the exception of one piece, four years, or oh, perhaps five. It's an incredible output and an incredible evenness of quality when you, when you look at them from start to finish. So, what I really like about the work is that it, it actually begins with what I consider to be the best form of practice available to learn to draw. Uh, one of the, uh, the Belvedere torso, the tonal piece in the far room, and the drawing of the plaster cast hand done not from the actual plaster cast, but from the actual uh, copy of the, the printed page uh, of them. And at the Academy in Florence, which is one of the few places in the world that still survives where you can go to learn uh, classical draftsmanship, 
they have the old, they practice the old Bach and Jerome um, drawing course. So for the first year, I think, you'll be drawing from uh, reproductions of those casts. And in the second year, they'll actually give you the cast. And if you're still there, you might get into a life class. Um, it's a wonderful training that, that, in fact, doesn't really exist in many places today. There's still the Budapest Academy, there's uh, uh, the Edinburgh College of Art, there's the Royal College, although it's not fairly conceptual. And drawing in this manner in the art schools around the world, more or less didn't survive the, what I call the conception, the conceptual uh, inquisition of the early 70s, where all the life rooms were closed down. All of the statues, all of the Greek and Roman statues, uh, were smashed, and, uh, and the conceptualists took over, and of course, art schools started to model themselves on the Bauhaus model rather than the Renaissance model. So classical draftsmanship was killed off. Uh, almost, uh, I, I was fortunate myself to um, get the tail end of the academy, and, and uh, my stories are uh, to do with drawing skulls for six months from nine, nine to five every day, and uh, five days a week, and then the old Professor Gibbons coming around with his calipers, uh, measuring us, and it wasn't exactly the same size as that. Uh, the skull out there, I'd have to do it again. And then finally, he got it right, and there's a great relief, and, and uh, he comes around and he gives you a drip coat, so that was how on. That was Ashton's, and that uh, school still survives, oddly enough. With this exhibition, what is remarkable is that it begins with, the, uh, with straight uh, representational uh, skill-based um, observation, learning how to measure and, and transfer imagery from a three-dimensional fact to a two-dimensional one with the plaster cuffs. And then, as the, very quickly actually, he then moves through to pairing it down to uh, a line. There's a charming uh, uh, etching, I think it is, of uh, Richard's wife, Anita, where it's, it's this one here. Um, to get from there mm -hmm, to there, usually it takes about 30 years, but this is dated 2012, and this one is is dated 2010, so he has really moved very, very rapidly. Um, and I think uh, that bridge has been a, you know, in all makes a very, very long and arduous bridge to cross. So, so the reduction of uh, something that's as detailed as this, and of course what this brings with it is a, a huge, uh, what we call the Renaissance model that goes back to initially to ancient Greece and Rome. Um, to go from there to here so quickly uh, requires a lot of um, intellectual presence um, and also being able to translate that from your mind and eye uh, through your hand onto the page. So I think uh, he's made incredible progress to go from, from uh, this study through to here. It's a journey that took Matisse most of his lifetime. When you look at early Matisse, um, certainly he did draw in this Jerome Bach tradition. And then uh, it wasn't until later life that you see him getting it down to a few lines. So it is a well-trodden pathway, and it's the journey that a lot of artists do make. Um, the, I suppose everything's moving much quicker now than, than it did in Matisse's day. So certainly, to, try, to, to actually compress this down to a couple of years makes me wonder uh, where Richard is going to take it to because he's still a very young artist. Um, so, That's nice. Great to hear yeah. that. <laughs> to hear that, <laughs> So, at this rate of progress, uh, it's just going to be fantastic to watch the development um, because it's, um, it seems to be going on really well. The other thing I'd like to say is that colour. Um, there's a sense of colour here that most people begin using colour as local colour. They go out, sky is blue, trees are green, walks are grey, except I'm sorry, water's blue, reflects the sky. But Matisse um, 
changed all that uh, as a focus initially, and it began to use colour as a creative engine itself. So when I look at Richard's paintings, particularly the one like the one behind me, you can see that the the colour is used as an expressive vehicle that's been released from its first function of describing um, you know, the, the form that it's sitting on. Uh, certainly, um, these are not um, local colours. Um, the, it's an invention. And I think one of the first um, jobs of the artist is to, as Oscar Wilde said, said once, or wrote once, is to make the, um, the in, in, invisible visible. Um, there are Chinese writers who have written about this as well. And the first job really is to invent something rather than just copy something. Uh, it begins like this, but then as you move on, you begin to move away from something that has its meaning outside itself. In other words, something that refers to a piece of literature or a story, um, to something that is self-contained and autonomous. So the idea of using colour as an autonomous element, um, not dependent upon um, uh, local colour, I think is a very creative endeavour. And when you look at the, you know, some of these bigger multi-figure compositions, you can see how well the, the figures just glow because of understanding of warm, cool and simultaneous contrasts. So I think that four years from now, another four years, where you take that to is going to be interesting. The narrative is something that I think that um, is unusual today as well. I had, can't remember seeing anybody uh, going back looking at Greek myths and legends. Um, certainly there's Picasso, but that was a long time ago. And uh, you know, you look at um, particularly his, some of the same themes you've in fact taken. Um, but in Australia, it's most unusual. Uh, so I suppose this is an outcome of having worked um, in, in uh, Florence, uh, being within easy walking distance of the Uffizi and looking at the Botticelli's. Certainly the graceful feminine metaphor uh, for female beauty here behind me, these wonderful dancing nymphs, um, automatically I think of, of, uh, of the Botticelli's. The Primavera, for example, although they are quite, quite static. I also think of some of those wonderful uh, paintings by Titian. There's the story of Marcius here, who, uh, who uh, was eventually came to a rather nasty end, um, being flayed because he uh, couldn't play his flute back to front, um, and had the impudence to uh, to take on one of the gods. And while I was away in London, I was just recently. The two big Titians are there, the flying of Marcius, and um, so it was on my mind, and then to come here and, and see him again over there, happily dancing, um, you've taken the happier moments of his life rather than the, the, grisly, <laughs> the grisly end. Um, it's just wonderful. These are themes that uh, pop up a lot in Europe, um, you know, particularly in France and the galleries you go through, and you'll see them in Italy. Uh, but here it's most unusual, particularly to come to Dalesford uh, or even, let's say, Victoria, and to find um, these, these influences is really quite you know, wonderful. One of my childhood heroes was actually Robert Graves, and um, he's also a good mate of uh, John Olson, who uh, is a, a friend of mine. And uh, in fact, John has always been influenced by Robert Graves. He wears his, um, his hat the same way, his um, dress is the same way. Graves was a very um, sort of uh, patriarchal figure. And John first met him when he was cooking um, in uh, Dea in New Yorker. So, you know, these myths have always been my favourite ones. So I warm to them uh, on many levels, not just the level of uh, ancient um, myths and legends, but also on the level of creativity. Um, I think that uh, it's a wonderful output for four years, a wonderful transition, and uh, I think it's just going to get better. I think this is just the beginning 
and what promises to be a magnificent uh, journey for you. And, um, and with those few words, um, I think it's my old word and expression. Thank you very much, Jeff. Really lovely of you. And it's um, a real honour to have you here with us and uh, to get some of your insights. And from an artist's point of view, it's wonderful to be able to have somebody look at my work and to be able to read it, obviously, as well as he can. The, um, the, the myth, the, the debauchery of the, um, the Greek gods is very much part of what I enjoy doing, as you can tell. Um, and just as Jeff was saying, the, the Greek myths have such a lust for life. And the, 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 the Greeks could be could smite you and um, be pretty nasty at times, but gen generally it's all about enjoying life and getting out there and conquering dragons and saving man damsels in distress and all that type of thing. And the, the journey for me, as Jeff mentioned, was um, really took a turn in Florence, but if I just go back before Florence, um, I started studying architectural administration under a gentleman called um, Robert Gill, and Bob became a lifelong friend, and I studied with him for about seven years, and Bob wrote, literally wrote the book on perspective construction, and was one of the top architectural illustrators in the world when he was drawing. And through Bob, I, I, I learned composition, and I learned all the classical approach to design. Then when I was lucky enough to, uh, to go through to Florence and study at the academy there, the reason I went there was, um, I don't say I could. <laughs> and you don't say no. <laughs> but um, it was really their, their classical approach. It was the only place in the world that I could see where they were really teaching the old academy way of doing it. And they believe very strongly you learn to draw, then you learn to paint, and then after a couple of years, they let you paint a pair, and, that, and, that's, that's, and then you move from there. But what I wasn't in, what um, I wasn't prepared for when I went to Florence was that I ended up teaching perspective, and which I was really trying to stay low on that side of things. But that was just an amazing experience because, for those of you who don't know, perspective is the way you get a third dimension into a picture. It's the way you get depth and solidity. And perspective was invented in Florence. And I was actually doing a gentleman called Brunelleschi, and there was Alberti and a couple of others around them as well. But I was actually standing on the steps of the Duomo in Florence, teaching a group of students about perspective on the exact spot that Brunelleschi stood in 1436, I think it was, with Cosimo Medici and all of the other dignitaries showing on this brand new thing called perspective. And it's perspective that actually made the Italian Renaissance happen. We wouldn't have Michelangelo's paintings or da Vinci's paintings in the form that they are if it wasn't for perspective. And here's a kid from Australia <laughs> taking perspective back to its home. It was just an enormous experience. It was just, it blew me away. And from there, um, from there my journey, I, I got so to get a handle on the, uh, the realism, as you can see from the, uh, some, some of the work in the print room. And I've always believed that art is a dialogue across time with other artists. So all of the artists that have happened before us have had their say. And now our generation of artists, it's time to stand up on the podium and have our say too. And as I started to work with with realism, um, I could do it, um, but I was just finding, for me, it was just a bit restricted. And you've got these teensy weensy little brushes <laughs> for five months to, to do this tiny little still life, and they look beautiful. But in that process, what I was realising was it also scrubbed out the life. And I looked at a lot of the work that was being done around me in Florence, and I could see the same thing. Beautifully painted, absolutely beautifully executed, but just no life. And so that's where, 
in my journey, then I started to look for how can I bring life and colour and energy into the work and really charge it? And also, how can I respond to the masters that have happened before me? You know, that go right back to the Lascaux Caves, seven and a half thousand years ago, where they did these paintings on the ceilings of caves that are just mind-bogglingly beautiful. You know, they could hang in any gallery in the world today as modern art. How do you actually respond to that without just copying what somebody else has done? And so my journey was sort of blending things together and I ended up actually blending the classical knowledge from the Renaissance with the innovations of the moderns. I remember about the 1930s and 1940s in particular, the moderns, Matisse, Picasso, Modigliani, Cezanne, earlier than that, they were all changing space and looking at space in a very, very different way to what had happened before. And by blending the Renaissance and modernism together, I started my own expression. And that's what's hanging on the walls around you. The, the way I work is, because I keep on getting asked how, how do I actually create something like that. Um, one thing is I never work for models. So I do a lot of figure drawing, and I draw in a lot of different styles when I'm doing the figure drawing. Back in the academy it was you know, weeks and weeks and weeks, probably five, six weeks working on one figure. Um, the Belvedere torso in there took me five weeks, working eight to ten hours a day, every day, to do that drawing. So that teaches you how to see, it teaches you your anatomy. But what I find is that if I've got a model in front of me, I get wound up with the anatomy and, and trying to draw the human figure. But to me, that's not what art is about. Art is about connecting on an aesthetic level, first of all, so I want to create something that's beautiful. On another level, it's about resonating with the soul and the spirit. And then on another level, again, it's about intriguing the intellect. And for me, art needed to work on all those three levels. So what I found was, if I work without a model, then I can, then I can focus on the aesthetics. I can get the rhythms, the, the repeating curves happening through the piece. And I can distort the figures to accentuate. It's a process of beautification and simplification. So I look for the objects that make, or the things that make something beautiful, and things that make a woman beautiful. And often, it's not the features, it's just a line or a proportion, something very simple. And I focus in on that. And with something, with all of these pieces, there's a structure in behind them which is quite strong. So what I do is I intuit the idea and I build the structure in behind. So um, if we look at this painting, there's actually quite a strong line running up through there, which is very, which is really a strong, strong horizontal line. That position, that line was the first line I drew in this picture. And I don't know if any of you have come across the golden mean. But that's, a, that's a proportion which is a divine proportion. So that's if we've got a line, and we're going to break it into two. What's the most beautiful way that we can break that into two? Or if you've got a rectangle that's a long side and a short side, what's the most beautiful shape? The Egyptians, I think it's even before the Egyptians discovered that this ratio, the golden mean, 1 to 1.618, was that gave the most beautiful proportion. So, strange, strangely enough, if you, take the, if you take the height of this picture and you come up to that line there, from there to there is one unit, from there to there is 1.618. So from my first line, I have a beautiful proportion. And then this lady, surprisingly, is my vertical. The second line I painted, or I drew, was this line. No cubic no for guessing. If you go from there to there, that's one unit. If you go from there to there, it's 1.618. So the divine proportion, I think, is very appropriate as well because I'm dealing with the gods. <laughs> but what it, from an artist's point of view, what it gives me is it gives me all of those rectangles now and the subdivisions are beautiful. And I've done nothing but draw just two lines. And then I layer up everything on top of that. My rhythms, my contrast, 
accentuating the colour, and I build it and build it and build it. So on that note, <laughs> I think I hope everybody's got charged glasses. Well, we, well, we've got something. Because what I would like to do, what I would like to do, because we're here, we're in this beautiful convent gallery, which I had to thank the convent gallery and Tina, hiding up there in the back, who's been a magnificent supporter and who's um, put this put this exhibition together. I'd like to thank Anita. My wife, news, framer, etcher, a curator, manager, etc., 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 fill in the blanks, for doing such a wonderful job curating you. Greg and Jeff, of course, are just, been, just fantastic. And they've been, it's been a real honour meeting these two gentlemen. And so the energy that both of them throw into their work. And I see a lot of similarities between our work on that deeper level. At the, at the, our, our work is very different when you look at it at the start, but the subdivisions and the way colour is used and things is, um, is quite similar in a lot of ways. And of course I'd like to thank Robbie for the catering. <laughs> <laughs> and on the catering note, I'd like all the rage of glasses, because here we are in the convent gallery, Christian gallery, with the, with the heathen gods and the pagan gods around us, Bacchus, orgies, drinking, all of all, everything that's good about life. And I'd like us all to drink to the gods. May the gods be with you. Yeah.